Good evening and welcome to the Center for Global Humanities at the University of New England. My name is Josh Pahigian and it's my pleasure to welcome you all for this special hybrid event in which we'll be joined by one of our UNE Morocco faculty members, Tony David, for his lecture, Is Harvard Killing Me? Tony is a historian, professor, author, translator, and ghostwriter. He's a faculty member, as I said, in Morocco, uh, teaching classes such as Writing Sans Frontiers and Biography of Tangier, while also being the editor of our student-run literary magazine, Moorish Tides, which showcases our students' exploits in Morocco, Spain, and other points in Northern Africa. Trained as a historian in Berlin and Jerusalem, as well as at the University of Chicago, where he earned his PhD, Tony has produced a long list of books, including such titles as Gershom Shalom, A Life in Letters, The Patron, A Life of Salman Shokin, Lamentations of Youth, The Diaries of Gershom Shalom, and The Correspondence of Hannah Arendt and Gershom Shalom. This evening, Tony is going to tell us about his latest writing project, titled The Daring Club, The Many Lives of Svetlana Boim. Please join me in welcoming, from across the Atlantic, our friend, Tony David. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, welcome from Tangier, and I understand that because of weather, we have kind of an intimate uh, uh, crowd, so I'm really glad, uh, honored, I should say, to be in, invited uh, to address you. First of all, I wanna thank Josh and my friend Neil, but mainly the, the Center for Global Humanities and the university. And what I'm gonna be talking to you about today is, is about a topic and a person, I think very um, intimately involved and relevant to the, 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 the theme of global humanities and exploring the human condition of the 21st century, that, that our university is so committed to the health of the planet and to the health of the human mind is something that uh, I'm aware of and I'm very proud to be a part of it. And I believe, having said all that, and Josh, thank you for, for your introduction, but I, I, wanna, I wanna exercise a bit of humility here. I think Svetlana Boim would have been a much better speaker for you today. She, from what I, I've never met her, but from what I've heard, she, she was mesmerizing as a speaker. And I, I'm a biographer, so I'm presenting to you her story, but her story is a very complicated one. And as you can probably tell by the by the title of the talk, is Harvard killing me? There's there's a bit of a mystery here about her final months, and I'm going to be dangling in front of you uh, this mystery of of her life and her her legacy, really what she left behind. She was a, a scholar who bravely and very provocatively wrote and thought about the meaning of life, war, peace, the role of humanities in society. And one question that I have and one mystery I want to dangle in front of you is the fact that the hero, excuse me, the hero of her of her life at the very end of her life wasn't herself. She created a literary double ganger named Zanita, who she presented as as the hero of her story. And I'm gonna be asking the question why and, and hopefully illuminating that question. First, a bit about uh, Svetlana. She was a literary critic, visual and media artist, playwright, novelist. She was known for her innovative work on, on the theory of, of postmodernism. She, she coined the phrase off modernism and she was the Kurt Hugo Reisinger Professor of Slavic and Comparative Literature at Harvard and was an associate at the Graduate School of Design. And she was, in other words, a very accomplished lady. Uh, she was first diagnosed with cancer in January 2015, and she passed away on August 5th, 2015. My work in writing her story began shortly before COVID. I was in Tangier. And teaching my classes and the, um, her parents and the, the comparative literature department at Harvard turned to me because I have a background like Josh said in, in writing intellectual histories of Europe, European uh, Jews and European intellectual figures. So they thought that I would be 
uh, a good candidate to tell her story. And I was still teaching my classes. I couldn't give them a yes or no. I, I didn't know very much about her. Uh, I, needed, I needed a break in order to really thrust myself into her work. And I got that when COVID struck because we were airlifted out of Morocco and with my family, ended up in Sacramento, California, at my in-laws house. And I had a couple weeks of quarantine where I can just pour my energies into her books and really decide whether I was the right fit for this. I just finished a book about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, I had ghostwritten it and I was looking for a, a new project and I was humbled by, by the offer, but I had some doubts as well. And part of my doubts came from my experience in teaching creative writing here in Tangier. I'm an historian, but I'm teaching very smart UNE students who come here for a semester. And in, in my courses, they, they usually have to go out and interview people and use creative nonfiction tools in talking about them. And these are mainly you know, pre-med students. These are STEM students and they're talking, they're usually interviewing people in hospitals or in other professional settings. But I teach them how to write dramatically about people. And I didn't know whether I could do that with Svetlana. I didn't know enough about her. And I didn't know if I could apply the hero's journey onto her, her life and tell something that, that readers would, would, would benefit from. Um, so I began uh, in the backyard, in quarantine, writing uh, notes to the books as I read them. And what I discovered, which was, uh, which was a very interesting fact about her, that she wrote herself into most of her scholarly books, and, which is a very unusual strategy for those of you who, who, who are involved in the humanities, at least, um, but also the hard sciences, serious scholars typically don't write themselves into their own books. And we, we typically take a very distant third person perspective, wanting to be objective. Well, she didn't really, she violated those rules pretty systematically. And which was good for me because I was able to, to, to read her books and glean materials for her biography from her published works. So I, um, together with conversations I had with her parents, of course, uh, they were they were, they live in Boston, so I was phoning them almost every day, and I was I was getting a good picture of who she was. Um, she she was raised in Leningrad, which is now Saint Petersburg, in what what used to be called a communal apartment, and these are these were grand bourgeois ap apartments that were seized by the Soviet government after the revolution in 1917, chopped up. And each room was handed over to a family. So an entire family would often live in one room. That's how she was raised. Her parents, uh, Jewish parents, of course, and she, um, they were communists. She was a communist. She went to the communist youth group. She never objected to the most of the ideology. Um, she had a very happy childhood. She went to a school named after the poet Pushkin. And most importantly for, for this lecture, she went to an after-school program, writing program called the Daring Club. Well, in 1979, out of the blue, she went to the Crimea for summer vacation. And she was standing in line waiting for beer when a, an architect from Moscow approached her and asked her to leave the Soviet Union with him. He was looking for a partner to escape the Soviet Union, to immigrate, to go to America. And she said yes, not because she was a dissident, not because she was unhappy, but because it was, it was an adventure. Well, it wasn't so easy. It took them a year. They, they got married. They barely knew each other, but they got married. And, and they, they finally got permission to leave. And in 1981, Svetlana arrived in Boston and became this superstar uh, in the academic world, first at Boston University and then at Harvard. And she, she published her first book in 1991 based on her dissertation. And the first book, once again, a book that she brought in her own experiences and was about the Russian futurists, which 
was a poetic movement in started before the, the revolution, uh, Bolshevik revolution. And the futurists, most of them supported Lenin and um, because they believed that Lenin and the Bolsheviks would modernize the Soviet Union and they were equally hostile as the Bolsheviks to the past. So that was her book. The next book was called Commonplaces. And this was a goldmine for me because it was really about her communal apartment that she was raised in. And uh, the way she describes her communal apartment sounds something like the, the, the Shining, if you know the film. This is the way she describes her hallway. Quote, it is a place of transition, a place of fear, the dark limit of the house. It could preserve traces of a building's former elegance. From the darker side, we would have to picture all sorts of unreported crimes from rape to murder committed in a state of total intoxication. The blurb on the back of the book, published by Harvard University Press in 1994, lauds her, quote, as a member of the last Soviet generation, the Russian equivalent to our Generation X. The book was stamped with authority because she was writing about herself. We step around Uncle Fidia, asleep in the hall, surrounded by a puddle of his own urine, and enter into the communal apartment, which was supposed to be a communal utopia, only to end up as the breeding ground for KGB informants. The next book I study, remember, I'm sitting in the backyard reading all this stuff and getting you know, increasingly interested in her as a character. The next book uh, made her famous. It was a 2001 book called The Future of Nostalgia that explores uh, what two two different kinds of nostalgia. The one kind of nostalgia she calls reflective nostalgia, which is what historians do and all of us do, and it's quite healthy. We think about our past, but we're not enslaved by the past, and we don't escape to the past. Now, where she objected and where she turned her very formidable guns on was was what she called restored restorative nostalgia, and. She just described it as, quote, a longing for a place, but is actually a yearning for uh, a different time, the time of childhood, the slower rhythms of, of our dreams. In a broader sense, nostalgia is a rebellion against the modern idea of time, the time of history and of progress. The last book she published, Another Freedom, which came out in 2010, in my mind, reinforced the image of a woman bravely moving into the future. The title is the riff off uh, a Pushkin poem that she was raised on, as all Russian children were and still are. And in this poem, the great 19th century poet Pushkin announces that Russians actually don't need democracy and human rights and a free press and all this stuff that people in the West have because they have a higher freedom. And in, in Svetlana's reading of this, this was delusional, that they were compensating for their chains by by thinking that they were morally superior and culturally superior to, to the decadent West. The, one of the, the villains of this book was Asif Mandelstam. And, and she accused him in the book of groveling in front of Stalin to save his skin, at the same time writing these poems about higher freedoms uh, and, and about a Russia that had disappeared and probably never existed in the first place. And Boynton's belief in short was that we are all migrants with no motherland to return to. She was very much an anti-nationalist, of course. She went so far as to launch uh, an improvement on postmodernism she called off-modernism, which was her way of following what she called the non-linear conception of cultural evolution. It could follow spirals and zigzags, the movements of the chest knight, but what it didn't do was go backward. So by the time the quarantine was over, I felt I had a pretty good handle on who she was. And she had, she had this ethos of letting the dead bury the dead. And that, uh, that was reinforced in the very last article she wrote before her cancer diagnosis. She published it in, at the end of 2014 in the magazine, The, the Tablet. And there she wrote that it's titled A Soviet Dropout's Journey to Freedom. And she describes how she intentionally forgot much of what she had experienced in Russia in her youth for the sake of a new beginning. There was, in short, for me, a lot to admire about her. 
And as a hero of her own story, she certainly had a lot of drama to her. David Domrosch, the head of the, the Department of Comparative Literature, in an email to me, he, he, he called uh, the book that he wanted me to write a fascinating story of immigration and intellectual and artistic transformation. Uh, I, I completely agreed. I still hadn't signed the contract. I still hadn't formally agreed to do it. But I was, I was at this point very interested. I was doing a lot of inter interviews with, with friends and, and colleagues. That was when her parents decided to send me a 100-page manuscript that she had written in the, the, the final months of her life. It was, it was a kind of memoir, and it written in vignette form. And it wasn't the kind of linear chronological memoir that you would expect. It doesn't start with her childhood and end in 2015. It jumps around quite a lot. And as I began reading this 100-page manuscript, things got very wonky for me. Um, the journey to freedom that she had written about in the tablet was nowhere in sight. In some respects, it was almost like a, a literary demolition derby. She quoted... Uh, de Tocqueville to sum up her feelings about Harvard, she said, quote, I know of no place in which there is so little independence of mind and real freedom of discussion. In this memoir of hers, she barely mentions her books and her ex-husbands. America doesn't come off very well either. The oppression she experienced in America, she writes, was less visible than behind the Iron Curtain, but all the more pervasive. In one long scene, She's watching a PBS program, uh, typing on her bed. Uh, this is just after a, a chemo, chemo session. And she was watching a program on Yuval Harari's Sapiens, if you know the book. And she began asking very hard questions about herself and about the world. In this era of rapid technological change, she writes, where the past is often dismissed or, or as irrelevant or mere ornament, and machines may soon replace human beings. She asked, is there a danger of us becoming non-beings? She speaks of dystopia, where inquiring humans will, will be replaced by a new cast of cyborgs. She writes about the dominance of the entertainment industry over a bunch of artists, science, scientists, and academics, of the PRification of culture where questions of individual identity replace larger questions and profounder questions of soul and truth. In other words, she started using language that she never used in her published uh, work. Even stranger than all this for me was how she herself was becoming unreliable as a narrator. Uh, here I was, I was supposed to be writing an authorized biography, meaning that the family and, and the university had to sign off on it. And they clearly believed that Svetlana had been a roaring success in her life. But here she was taking aim at the very image of herself. She wrote about various pseudonyms that she used. She wrote about her online dating avatars. Uh, and she wrote about desperate loneliness. If it weren't for the deep tenderness that she used, a, a voice of a tone of love and hope that she used in talking about Leningrad as her youth, I would have just assumed that she had lost it. She was lost because of the disease, because of the, because of the treatment. Um, but that really wasn't it. So why, I asked myself, was she trying to dismantle everything that she created? Um, and more importantly, what was luring her back to the past? So in the vignettes, she turns to the belief in utopia that she was raised on. She writes about the Daring Club, the Creative Writing Club, her, her dissident teachers who instilled in her a deep appreciation for the Russian language, culture, and various forms of, of resistance. She writes about Crimea, the, uh, a place that she loved more than any other place on earth. She associated Crimea with life, light, poetry, love, a kind of freedom that uh, once again, she couldn't find elsewhere. And she writes about Mandelstam, the villain of another freedom, who suddenly is the hero of her youth and the very muse of this, of this, this memoir. Svetlana, being as smart as she was, she knew she was violating her own prohibitions against 
restorative nostalgia, because she was looking back with a longing to the dreams of her Soviet youth. And she even came up with a new definition of, of nostalgia in, in this manuscript. She calls it pers perspective nostalgia. And, it, and it's a kind of a nostalgia when you look back at your past at all the, the roads you didn't take. Uh, she calls this, and I'm quoting, um, pa a past future that never came to be. In other words, she began exploring the dreams that she had in her youth that she abandoned by emigrating and moving to America. And, and she believed that these dreams were burningly important for people who read uh, books like Sapiens today to break this, this, this miasma of, of dystopia that she saw surrounding her. I remember pacing the backyard back and forth in California, thinking about what in the world she's, she's up to. I still hadn't finished reading the manuscript, but I was determined now to write the book. And there was something extraordinary about her and her courage, her bravery. Um, the biggest problem was how to write a book whose hero had just demolished her own accomplishments. If she undermined herself, who's the hero of her story? I had to continue reading the manuscript to find out. In the vignettes, she created a double ganger she called Sunita, who split off from her in 1979 in the Crimea, waiting in line for beer. And she, by staying in Russia, Zanita succeeded where Svetlana had failed. She had a family, a child, was an engaged journalist fighting for, for justice. She remained a faithful disciple of Mandelstam and of the Daring Club. She had meaning to her life inside of Russia and because she, she aimed to improve the system from within, I'm quoting, uh, trying to make it better and not leaving it. Zuniti could answer the ultimate questions about hope, life's meaning, and about resistance to injustice and violence, whereas Svetlana couldn't. In a dramatic meeting in 2000, in this fictionalized memoir, Svetlana and Zanita meet in a bar in Leningrad, now renamed St. Petersburg, and to Zanita in this bar, glamorous Svetlana is someone to pity, not admire, because there's no love in her life, no ultimate meaning, nothing to fight for, and nothing to fight against. Um, and yet she's, she's, in her eyes, rich and successful and powerful, but pitiable. Svetlana then says this about Zanita. In my heart of hearts, I know that she's right about me. In other words, Zanita, the doubleganger, becomes the moral judge of her life. It reminded me when I read this of an Edgar Allan Poe short story called William Wilson about a man plagued by a doubleganger who embodies his conscience and who gets so rankled by this doubleganger that he, uh, he has a duel with him and he kills him in a duel only to realize that he'd killed himself. It was exhilarating for me to see Svetlana's mind at work and her soul, but her literary device heightened the dilemma. How could I make Svetlana the hero of her biography if she already handed Zanita that role? Not knowing how to proceed, I did what I tell my students when they're stuck in their writing. I did more research. I recalled hearing from her parents that they had found on, on Svetlana's hard drive after she died, uh, a file um, containing notes to a 300 page novel that she wanted to write about Crimea. According to the parents, people at the university had seen the notes and they, they believed the parents and university people believed that uh, for my work, it wouldn't be very helpful. It'd be a massive rabbit hole. And I had to kind of pester them for a couple of weeks until they sent it to me. And this was in May, 2020. And again, I got it and I began scrolling through the manuscript only to discover that in this, this chaos of notes, Svetlana called this manuscript her autobiography. And it's a work of autofiction. And to get a handle on it, I started looking for the most obvious places when you're reading a novel for the setting and the theme, the dramatic arc, who the character is, who's the, who the hero is. So in this autobiography, she in fact retells the story of her own life with some, some surprising uh, plot twists that revealed a lot about her state of mind 
let's say in late spring, early summer, 2015, when she made the notes. The novel set in 2014, just after Vladimir Putin, a gangster in her eyes, ordered his mercenaries to seize her beloved Crimea. Could politics account for her reassessment of her life? I asked myself, so I kept digging. The narrator is a mirror image of Svetlana. Her name was, her name is in the novel, Ina, a highly accomplished Russian Jewish professor at an elite Boston University who arrived to Boston from Leningrad after meeting a guy in a line in Crimea for beer in 1979 and made a name for herself with the book about the cultural role of forgetting, how progress requires that we forget much of our past, especially for immigrants. Ina, comes to a dead end in her scholarship and in her life with the invasion of Crimea. She drops the idea of forgetting and realizes that she had only forgotten her past due to a kind of cultural imperialism imposed on her by, uh, by the, the norms of the university that, that demanded that she assimilate into Boston culture. She likens herself to an, an amputee told to forget about her missing limbs her Russian limbs. But she now remembers what Crimea had always meant to her. Her quest is in the novel is to do something about it. But what could she do? Her response is symbolic. She wants her university Slavic studies department to come out with a statement in support of, of Ukraine. Even a symbolic act would reclaim from Putin, she thought, and his ilk, what it means to be Russian. Inspired by Mandelstam. After her colleagues show no interest in the issue during a staff meeting, Ina stares out the window, then excuses herself to go to the restroom. And in the restroom, she splashes water on her face. And she looks at herself in the mirror and she begins interrogating herself. And she asks herself, why are we here? It's at this point that her muse Mandelstam speaks up from her memory. She recalls in high school writing an essay on the meaning of life based on Mandelstam's poetry and his essays. And yes, she says to herself, staring at herself in the mirror, um, the point of life is to expand the world, to make meaning. I cannot imagine living without searching for an ultimate meaning to life, she exclaims. Then she begins laughing and crying with a kind of primal joy. And she says, oh my God, I'm so ridiculously Russian after all, for all these years. Well, reading this, my hands were shivering, and I thought to myself, this would be a perfect title for the book. Oh, my God, I'm so ridiculously Russian after all. I kept piecing the story together. At, at a highbrow university event in the novel, Over Wine, Ina tells a graduate student named Jim about her reconciliation with Mandelstam and her epiphany in the bathroom. The conversation turns melancholy after she, she says that Stalin had ordered Mandelstam's death in 1938. So sad, Jim said. Being an environmentalist, which is what he called himself, he would have tried to save old-fashioned Mandelstam like the human version of the endangered species of polar bears or rare monkeys, I'm quoting. He tells Ina he thinks Mandelstam should have left Russia when he had a chance. He could have given the pointless lectures in New York or Paris, but at least he would be alive. Uh, and Ina looks at him and screams, no, Mandelstam was a Russian writer and died on Russian soil. In the novel's dramatic structure, Ina finds her quest when she decides to write an autobiographical novel inspired by Mandelstam, who else, that will show how Russian literature can defeat a tyrant. She leaves the cocktail party and begins her novel about two doublegangers, a fictionalized account of her own life. Just like the Svetlana Zanita split, these double gangers, gangers both named Lina, uh, are on a beach in the Crimea in 1979. One, uh, so they meet this charismatic uh, man. Half of the, the Lina goes to America, the other half stays in Russia. The half that went to America dies after 30 years of some mysterious disease. And the only thing she left behind her after a glorious career is a, is a hat in a, under glass in a museum somewhere. The other doubleganger, the Zanita character, goes on to fight Putin 
in Crimea. This character, the hero of the hero's journey, embodies the spirit of Mandelstam and therefore the spirit of the Daring Club. In this autobiographical novel within an autobiographical novel, Svetlana kills off her own character and she sets up the double ganger um, to take on Putin. Lena doesn't fight the Russian regime with guns, but with Mandelstam's nostalgia for world culture, which is a uh, profound recognition in Mandelstam's uh, thinking of how the past continues to shape the present, how language carries the weight of history, culture, and ideas across generations, and how this accumulated wisdom can resist totalitarian or corporate forces to seek to sever ties with the past and to reshape us, society, in their image. Lena, after somehow chasing away Putin's mercenaries, becomes the founder of a utopian community, uh, a commune, a kind of kibbutz called the Red Zion, where writers, dreamers, and professors from all over the world, like Svetlana and Ina, can come and learn about nostalgia for world culture and then go home and inspire everyone else. So ultimately, the novel was Svetlana's way to rediscover Mandelstam and present him as a solution both to the Russian dictatorship and to American dystopia two sides of the same coin for her in a world order that was falling apart. If the novel has a theme, it's the Russian dictum, the poet outlives, the czar, the pen wins out over the gun. So I ended up um, writing a very different kind of biography than I imagined. Uh, it's not authorized. I followed Svetlana's lead by uh, making Zanita the narrator, the judge of her life. Uh, I also wrote, not as a detached scholar, but someone deeply convinced that this woman left a lot more to us than a hat under like, in a museum. She, she has an immensely vital message for us that pertains to global humanities. Go back to the, the larger theme of our conversation and how we should live in a very confusing time today. Now to get at Svetlana's larger message, I had to dive into Mandelstam, very difficult uh, poet and thinker and his nostalgia for world culture. So what is this kind of nostalgia and how does it relate to our conversation about global humanities? Well, let me just tell you a little bit about Mandelstam's deeper thinking about language. Before the revolution, he belonged to a poetic movement launched by his friend and fellow poet, Nikolai Kumilev. It was called Acmeism and was based on the medieval notion that masters transmit to their apprentices a set of techniques and a spirit for working with words, instruments that are as tactile as, as like wood, iron, or glass. Acmeism sought to bring poetry to its pinnacle, the acme, by encompassing poetic voices from all ages. Thus, a poet, a poet, let's say, writing about a cathedral in Moscow, wouldn't just see spires and stones and glass. He would feel the ancient Hellenistic spirit of Byzantium, and even earlier of the Hebrew poets and of Plato. He ran into trouble, of course, because the entire point of the Bolshevik Revolution and the dictatorship installed by Lenin was to tear up the past. So Lenin ordered Gumilev shot and Mandelstam fled St. Petersburg for Crimea. It was there that he wrote his most famous essays that Svetlana was raised on and then returned to at the end of her life. In these essays about nostalgia for world culture, he lashes out at the revolutionaries like the futurists for severing the source of the Rus Russian language. Once the roots get cut, he wrote, people would read Dostoevsky or look at a basilica without understanding, quote, the forces that raise them up and the blood that flows in their veins. Nostalgia for world culture is the way the past feeds the present, but equally a form of resistance. In Russia, said Mandelstam, writers have no need for an all powerful ruler, a centralized state or a Kremlin, which is the, the Russian word for fortress. To, keep, um, to help them forge their tools. Every word for them in Russian is its own, he says, small Kremlin, a winged fortress equipped for incessant struggle against the formless element with the non-being that threatens our history from all sides. Now the non-being he was referring to, of course, was Stalin and the communist regime. 
in his final days of life at a gulag in Siberia, condemned to death because of a poem he wrote mocking Stalin. Mandelstam sat with average Russians arrested on the whim of the government. The mesmerized fellow prisoners listened in complete silence as if he were a prophet. Many of his poems survived Stalin's terror because prisoners who, who survived the gulags memorized them. Or they, they scrawled the poems on the walls of the prison. Joseph Brodsky, the Nobel Prize winner and dissident Russian Jewish poet, said of Mandelstam that Stalin had killed him because, this is a long quote, linguistic and by implication, because of his linguistic and by implication, his psychological superiority. A song is a form of linguistic disobedience, and its sound casts a doubt on more than concrete political systems. It questions the entire existential order. Because of that, Stalin's iron broom, whose purpose was the spiritual castration of the entire population, couldn't have missed him. But what Mandelstam did will last as long as the Russian language lasts. It will certainly outlast the present and any subsequent regime in Russia, both because of its lyricism and its profundity. I should point out in conclusion that uh, Svetlana's return to nostalgia for world culture wasn't just another form of elitism uh, exclusive to the educated. If at the end of her life she had lost interest in the ivory tower, she had high words of praise for her students from Serbia, Indiana, India, um, mainly students who were first generation university students and their families for whom the humanities were part of an ongoing struggle to know what it means to be human in our time and place. Every word we speak holds the potential for meaning and defiance. Nostalgia for world, world culture is about connecting with the universal human experience reflected in the past, the loves, the losses, struggles that uh, transcend human divides. As Svetlana's biography, I witnessed how the humanities became her final weapon, a way to not just understand the world, but to shape her legacy uh, which was now about remembering and not forgetting. Like the prisoners who carry Mandelstam's words with them, Zenita was Svetlana's act of defiance, a last will and testament that reminds us that through writing, through shaping our own narratives, we too can fight back against the forces that threaten meaning. For her and in the struggle, I count myself, like I said at the beginning, as a kind of disciple of hers. The humanities are not a luxury in times of a crisis, but the very tools we need in the relentless struggle for enduring truths. Thank you for this opportunity to, to share Svetlana's noble spirit with you. Thank you so much, Tony.